Our dream is that wherever we go, wherever we choose to live, that people respect us. Yeah. That we contribute to the advancement of the whole human race. That we can share in true prosperity. That we can make Jamaica the place of choice for you to choose to live, to work, to do business, raise your families, and if you choose, retire in paradise. I want to acknowledge my wife, Juliet, who is in the audience. High Commissioner Seth George Ramathon, who is doing a very good job. Minister Floyd Green, Minister of State, is it? Minister of Education, a lady who needs no introduction, but I would introduce her anyway, my good, 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 good friend, Don Butler. Thank you for hosting me, MP. Mr. Wade Lynn. Honorary Consul for Jamaica in Birmingham and other representatives of Birmingham. My good friend, I'm, I'm surveying the audience, I'm not seeing him, but I know he's here. Lord Bill. Lord Bill Morris, former General Secretary of the Transport and General Workers Union and um, former Chancellor of the University of Technology. Mayors, councillors, and other elected officials, other members of the clergy. I know that Oliver, my other good friend, is large here somewhere. Good to see you. Friends, thank you so much for coming out today. I felt a little bit worried when I saw the lines outside and realized that you had to go through so, so many checks to, to come in, but such is life when you live in a country. Yes. Uh, security is indeed a, a main concern these days. But I want to thank you for coming. You could have been elsewhere, and I'm certain that you would have had to make a significant sacrifice to come here. Some of you would have traveled from very far to be here. So I want you to know that I feel very humble, indeed feel very special that you would do this. Uh, and I'm very grateful, and I personally want to say thank you for coming. It means a lot to me. It does, it means a lot. Let me start with some domestic issues. And I mean local issues to the United Kingdom. When the request was made of the colonies to support the war effort, we responded. I, you know, on a regular basis, I attend ceremonies for the Jamaica Regiment, for Jamaican soldiers who fought in 
World War II. Uh, recently, I visited a home which was uh, upgraded, repaired, run by the Jamaica Defense Force and supported by the National Housing Trust, where there are several soldiers still alive who are now in their 90s. Some of them are immobile, you know, but they still regale you with stories of their time defending the British Empire. Many of that generation would have come to the United Kingdom, again invited to work. And they would have give, given up their effort earnestly and sincerely. And they would have contributed to building this great country. Their children would have also participated and contributed and would expect, if not feel, entitled to the rights and privileges ascribed to citizenship in this country. <laughs> After the end of empire, there was the commonwealth. And the Commonwealth is built on certain principles. Eh? The rule of law, indeed the common law, a common language, belief in democracy, and transparent institutions. The meeting of the Commonwealth heads of government just came to an end today and we spoke about how can we make the Commonwealth fair, how can we make it more sustainable, how can we make it more secure and how can we make it more prosperous. What has happened to the children of the Windrush generation is unfair. It is inconsistent with the values espoused by the United Kingdom. And it must be corrected. The Prime Minister has offered an apology and has said And I said that all effort will be made to correct the wrong. She has given her word to us, and when I say us, the heads of government of CARICOM who went to meet with her at Downing Street. As a colleague head, I take her at her word. My job as Prime Minister of Jamaica, a country which is a realm country of the Commonwealth, is to work with my colleague head to ensure that the principles of the Commonwealth are maintained. to ensure that the citizens of Jamaica and the people of Jamaica, even if they are not citizens of Jamaica, but they are the people of Jamaica, they are Jamaicans, that Caribbean people, that people who shared the same history 
that justice is done for them. So I will be dedicating time to follow through on this matter uh, and I do intend to periodically write to my colleague head to ask for an update in keeping with the commitments that were made. And of course, the High Commissioner and his staff will continue to maintain their vigilance in this matter. So now having dealt with that issue, I want to deal with some issues now that I know would be weighing on your minds about your homeland, Jamaica. So firstly, let me say to you that you don't have to be a citizen of Jamaica to be a Jamaican. Right? You're always welcome in Jamaica. Jamaica is your homeland. Let me put it another way. We estimate that there are about 800,000 Jamaicans living in the United Kingdom. <laughs> it may be more, but the official statistics say 800,000. All right? I know enough, but... <laughs> in the United States, we estimate, and it's difficult to estimate, but we estimate that it is over a million, likely 1.5 million. Said you were in, the, in, in Canada and we estimate about 400,000, roughly 400,000. But you would be interested to know that there is a Jamaican community in Costa Rica, an entire town, an entire area in Costa Rica, Port Lemon entirely Jamaican. They speak Spanish now, but it is nearly Patois in Spanish. <laughs> the accent has changed. In fact, you may know that the vice president recently elected of Costa Rica, a female, a woman, is a Jamaican. I recently attended the meeting, the Summit of the Americas, and my good friend, President Solis of Costa Rica, started to tell me his history. His great-grandparents were Jamaicans who left Jamaica in the 40s to go to Costa Rica to build the railroad. There is a significant Jamaican diaspora in Panama who left Jamaica to help to build the Panama Canal. There is an island just off the coast of Colombia. And it is probably in between Jamaica and Colombia in terms of the, the um, ocean space. And uh, that entire island, San Andres, is just Jamaicans. They speak Spanish now, obviously, but again, it is just patua in Spanish. <laughs> and there's scarcely a place that you go where there is not a Jamaican community. I was in Brussels recently, and we had over a hundred Jamaicans, plus several hundred regrets saying that they weren't able to come. So we are, we are all over. 
So it's hard for me to say, well, you know, Jamaica is a, a little country. We are a small island, but we're not necessarily a little country. Mm. Yes, we're little but we're tall. <laughs> So, I'm saying this to make the point that from the perspective of Jamaica, regardless of how long you have left and how many generations removed you are, or whether or not you have not claimed your citizenship because you were born elsewhere, as far as we are concerned, you are Jamaica. Don't let anybody tell you that you're stateless. You always have a place in Jamaica. Right? You always remember it. And so, a part of my job is not just to represent Jamaican citizens, but to represent the entirety of Jamaica. People who speak the language, share the common values, people who have the Jamaican swag, the style, the fashion, the culture, the music, the food. What do you mean? Oliver, you love you. That indomitable spirit, that competitive spirit, that assertiveness, which is oftentimes mistaken for aggressiveness. That has built Grand Jamaica. And all of us who are Jamaicans rely on Brand Jamaica. Gives you recognition. It gives you such an important thing which we have always fought for to be recognized and you're recognized by virtue of having an identity. So you are not lost in the UK as just another group. You are Jamaica. You have a voice, and that voice is amplified because you have a country that speaks for you. Support your country. Your country supports you. So I know that at the top of the list of concerns, what is happening with crime in Jamaica? Yeah. I've gotten the letters, the emails, the, the Twitter, direct messages, the Facebook comments. People stop me and ask me. And the main concern, really, you know, I'm afraid to come back to Jamaica. I've heard all the horror stories, particularly of those who have the romantic wish of coming back to live in Jamaica and uh, some tragedy has affected them in the pursuit of their dream. I want to assure you that this government of Jamaica will bring the crime problem to heal. I want to just make a few statements in this regard. Firstly, crime is affecting 
our growth process. Yeah. Yeah. It is affecting our economic process. There was a time when the thinking was that crime is generated from unfair, inequitable social conditions. So there was almost a kind of Robin Hood syndrome in crime. Because people are poor, because they are out of school, because they didn't have opportunity, that is why you might have to turn a blind eye to the crime situation. But there were other concerns as well, that there could be a link between crime and the political situation in Jamaica. But I hasten to say to you, that even if those things were true then, they are not true now. And the country cannot maintain an ambivalence to criminality. Those who seek to deal in drugs Much of it is a trade between Jamaica and the United Kingdom. Much of it is a trade between Jamaica and the United States. Those who seek to get themselves involved in organized criminality in gangs and in the procurement of illegal weapons who set up criminal networks to defraud the government of its taxes through illegally importing goods into Jamaica. Those who are involved in murder and other forms of mayhem, there is no excuse. So why not bring back There is no sympathy. The government must address those issues firmly. But there are some lessons, some very hard, painful, and costly lessons that the government of Jamaica has learned. In addressing the crime situation, human rights must be respected. Yes. That can never be taken for granted. In addressing the crime situation, we must make provision for the vulnerable and the poor. And so we have adopted a very progressive approach to the crime situation. Where's the before we get to that measure, <laughs> before we get there, firstly, we recognize that there are communities where the level of crime is elevated above what could be considered average elsewhere. And those communities require special measures. We have put in place a new piece of legislation called the Zone of Special Operations Community Development Act, where we have put in place